So we're very glad to have Pradeep here with us. He's at the Google at Mountain View at the Brain Team. And he has a great experience both in the academia and in the industry. He did um, his PhD at University, uh, uh, Penn, State, uh, Penn State University uh, with Adam Smith. And then he did his postdoc uh, at Microsoft Research in Silicon Valley and Stanford University. Uh, then he also joined um, Yahoo Research uh, and also Apple. As I said, he has great experience in the industry. And also at Apple, they did the first system where they applied differential privacy. And he was in charge of that. And I believe it's the first system in the industry that used differential privacy. And now he's at Google. So we are very glad to have him here. And his work is uh, the intersection between uh, machine learning and privacy. So please. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah, so this talk is going to be about uh, differentially private system, which we deployed recently at Google. And what I will do is I will take you through some of the research challenges and the system design challenges, which resulted in the algorithmic design we had to do during the course of the work. This is not just my work, it's like, at least three or four teams were involved in it. So I'm basically representing the work of many people here. Okay. Why is the slide not progressing? Okay, I'll touch. Okay, so uh, to start with, uh, and to set the stage, what are we trying to do here? We want to learn models. And uh, most cartoon view of the world is that you have a bunch of data samples, or you can think like user data. Each DI is a particular user's data, whatever form it may be. And there is a trusted learning algorithm, which an analyst or a user or an adversary wants to learn. And throughout the talk, we'll assume that the trust boundary is around the data and the algorithm. The adversary only sees the model. Okay. Furthermore, the adversary can make adaptive communication with it with the model. It can change the queries, and I will tell what I mean by that, like changing the queries, and it will get response. Okay. So the very high level question is what practical learning algorithms can we afford while preserving what is called differential privacy? And in this talk, I will give you a very specific instance of a particular problem and take you through the algorithmic designs of those unnecessary things. It's not saving anything. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, it's working. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. So, now the question is like, what are the practical learning algorithms we can afford while preserving differential privacy? To make the things a bit more formal, throughout the talk, I'll be focusing on non convex learning problems. And I would look at what is called minimizing the population risk or the test error, which basically if you are given a model, uh, you want to minimize the, uh, the loss on a data sample drawn from some distribution in expectation. Okay. And this picture is pretty obvious. I'm dealing with non-convex models, so it can have arbitrary behavior. Some of the examples are like ConNets, ResNet, recurrent neural nets, other things like alternate list squares. These are just like typical examples of the setup of the problem. Okay. This slide may be something completely boring to a lot of folks, but still it's worth kind of spending some time on the slide. So the notion of privacy I'll be focusing on in this talk is what is called differential privacy. This was uh, introduced by Dwarf McShane and Simon Smith in 2006, and a follow-up paper by Dwarf et al. in 2006. The high-level version of the definition says that an adversary learns almost the same thing about an individual user independent of their presence or absence in the data set. So the important thing to remember in this particular phrase is that an individual user, we are looking at what is called user level privacy. So the privacy guarantee you would give is with respect to the contribution, all the contributions of a single user. This is not just a training example. If the user has contributed 10 training examples, the privacy guarantee will respect to all the train training examples together. Formally what the definition says that the probability of an algorithm that is a, a calligraphy K of D, producing something in a, a, a set is close to the probability of the algorithm producing 
uh, in the something in the same set S on a data set D prime where one user's data has been removed. And these two probabilities are close by. And the closeness is measured by these two parameters, epsilon and delta. For the rest of the talk, it is not exactly important to understand the semantics of epsilon and delta. Just pretend that epsilon is a small constant, whatever small means here. And delta is a number which is really, really small, like one over super polynomial in the number of data sets, samples. Okay. And D and D prime are, as I told you, neighboring data sets, where in this case, the red uh, user has been removed in data set D prime. That's all you need to know for the rest of the talk. Okay. And this is a well accepted notion in the industry over the last five, seven years. There's been a lot of push, both in academia and industry, to kind of productionize these things. And what I'm going to say is one specific example of that. But if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we can talk. So now the uh, more systemic setup is the federated learning setup. So whatever I will be talking to you, it will conform to the structure of cross-device federated learning. It can be also used in centralized model training, but primarily I will focus on federated learning. So what I mean by cross-device federated learning, you have a bunch of, bunch of devices. Each device basically makes local model updates in the process of gradient descent. I think most people will understand what gradient descent is. So you'll make some local updates on your gradients. And after that is done, the gradient updates are sent to the server. The server would give you a new model update and the local updates again proceed, okay? And finally, the server will produce a model and this model is deployed onto the devices. So this is the general workflow of cross-device federated learning. Again, for the purpose of this talk, it is important to remember that the trust boundary is around the cloud and the devices during the whole training process. What the adversary sees is the only the models, final models that get deployed on the devices. You can operate over stronger trust uh, or weaker trust models, but in this talk, I'll just focus on this particular trust model. Okay. So here is the main punchline of the talk. So we deployed the next word prediction model for Spanish language Gboard. So if anyone uses Android keyboard, so on the Gboard for next word prediction for Spanish language, uh, this is for the European Spanish uh, with epsilon of 8.9 and delta of 10 to the power of minus 10. These are the privacy parameters with user level differential privacy. The last part may not be so obvious. So what happens is in differential privacy in the last few years, we have formulated a variety of versions of the definition for, for reasons good or bad. So this particular version is called zero concentrated differential privacy. It gives you a much tighter control over the privacy random variable. And we say that like this epsilon of 8.9 and delta 10 to the power of minus 10 corresponds to a GCDP guarantee of less than 0.1, which is 0.81. The meaning of GCDP is not that important. I think that less than one is good, okay? Two things to important, uh, two important things to notice here, and I will harp on this like as the talk progresses. To our knowledge, this is the first production ML model with a rigorous and the guarantee which is publicly stated. So it's a we we are stating that we are giving this parameter, and we'll tell you like what are the things that were necessary to actually make this formal statement. So in some sense, the word formal is quite overloaded here. So the structure of the talk. So first I will give you some background on differentially private machine learning. In particular, this algorithm called DP stochastic gradient descent. Then I will move on to this algorithm called differentially private follow the regularized leader, DPFTRL. So this algorithm was the one which actually helped us deploy the model which you wanted. And then I will show you some empirical evaluation on both on like public data sets and I'll also give you some idea on how in the production system it worked. And then finally, in the uh, fourth section, I will give you some ex extensions of this work, which you have been working on recently. Okay. okay. So DPHD. So this algorithm in its variety of forms has appeared in like at least three papers, including one of mine from 2014. 
So the idea is very simple. You will essentially do stochastic gradient descent as if you do non privately, excepting you let some noise. So you pick a mini batch of some size from the data set, which is sampled uniformly at random. Then on that mini batch, you compute the gradients of the current model state on each of the data points. And then is what you do this operation called clipping. You essentially scale down the gradients, individual gradients, if necessary, when it crosses some threshold. So you'll keep a threshold, let's say a clipping norm, and you'll say like, if the norm of the gradient, L2 norm of the gradient goes over that threshold, I'll just clip it down to that threshold. That's called the clipping. Then I take the average, I get the average gradient. Then what I do is instead of uh, feeding the average gradient to the model update, what I will do is I will add some Gaussian noise. I will tell the parameters of the Gaussian noise in a bit. And then essentially what you do, do the standard HGD update and the process continues. Two things to remember is that the first thing is this parameter L, it's the clipping norm is the scale at which you clip the gradients, each of the gradients. So that's L. And in the denominator, you have case K, which is the mini batch size. You have squared terms because I'm writing the variances. So if you think like of standard deviation, then the standard deviation of the noise is essentially scaled as the contribution a single gradient can have on the average. So L over K is the uh, contribution of the single gradient to GT. And I'm adding noise at that scale, excepting I have this parameter sigma squared which is called the noise multiplier. So it is the scaling of the sensitivity. Okay. So two things to remember from this particular slide is that you have this parameter one over K. So the amount of noise you add is in the scale of one over K. Sigma is the parameter which only depends on the privacy parameters like epsilon and delta. But K is the batch size. So you are adding noise essentially in the order of one over K. So that's the only thing to remember in this. So why does DPHD work? Well, there is this tool called privacy amplification by sampling, and there are variants of it, which has been developed in the last few years. So it says roughly that the, for the same level of privacy, one can add noise as if the gradients were computed on the complete data set, as opposed to a mini batch. What I mean by that? So if I'm computing the gradient on the mini batch of size K, I was adding noise in the order of one over K because one single gradient can change my response by one over k. But now what I'm saying is that you can pretend that you are operating actually on the complete data set and it is okay to add noise in the order of one over n. So clearly I'm adding much lower noise if I include privacy amplification by sampling. And that requires that you sample the mini batch uniformly at random from the complete data set. So now, if you if you compare the performance of your uh, algorithm on a version where you are accounting for privacy amplification by sampling, and where you are not, there is a huge gap. So this is an example from our paper on CFR10. You will see that if I don't account for DP, uh, amplification by sampling, then the for the corresponding epsilon, the accuracy is what I'm getting are much, much lower. So in some sense, privacy amplification by sampling is important in the training of DP models if you are operating on mini batches, which typically you do because full batch gradient descents are extremely expensive in practice and sometimes infeasible. So, as I told you in the first, I mean, beginning of the section, DPHDT and its close cousin. This is the close cousin. It's called DP federated averaging. This is a federated version of the same algorithm. The idea is roughly the same. What you do is, instead of sampling mini batch samples, you don't have a data set, right? So you're in the federated world. You sample a bunch of devices. Then you compute the gradients, clip the gradient, take the average at the same scale of noise the size of the data, uh, number of de uh, devices you are sampling, and you make the state update. Good. Why am I talking about this? Well, uh, 
so i'll tell about this in a bit so <coughs> so this algorithm will have a similar behavior as dphd if the devices were sampled uniformly at random excepting the fact that when you are doing federated learning and you are dealing with real world production systems it is almost impossible to actually sample these things at random because devices come and go and you don't have any control over it <coughs> but we saw in the previous slide that sampling was necessary for getting the privacy utility trade offs which are reasonable for dphd and so that would be also true for dp federated averaging i also wanted to make this small comment that whatever i'm talking about uniformly sampling of the devices one can flip this around and say that the devices can decide whether to participate or not by flipping a coin on this on their end this is called the poisson sampling and anything i will talk about privacy amplification by sampling or its issues would be relevant in the same context of poisson sampling okay so why did i say it is hard to near impossible of for doing this uh, yeah. <coughs> privacy amplification with sampling in the production system so this is a pattern of the client availability in production so you will see that this duodenal patterns are there so during the day it goes up during night it goes down or the other way down whatever so but you will have a sinusoidal pattern of this form and these things are not even stable so how does a client communication typically work you have a bunch of these devices first it has to be charging then it has to be on wifi and it is willing to submit gradients so these are the four conditions that is had to satisfy actually to give a gradient to the server <coughs> so it is very difficult to know the size of active population typical population sizes range from 10 to the power of 6 to 10 to the power of 10 typical number of devices participating can vary in the order of hundreds so now it is very hard from this kind of variable situation to actually sample uniformly sample devices because you don't have the control on the devices which is going to give you the data furthermore to make the things challenging so these are like real systems right so you will have load balancing methods which have been developed over the few years and just for an algorithm to train with differential privacy you cannot just throw everything out of the window and do something completely different so it is also incompatible with uh, some of the custom load balancing techniques which are there called pace steering so this makes amplification fairly hard to use in practice we did develop a feasible protocol in one of our papers in 2020 but it required fairly complex changes to the production infrastructure and the challenges uh, the changes are engineering was pretty expensive and the second thing is that we also saw that the i mean in simulation we also saw that the training time would increase like to prohibitive levels if we had to rely on amplification because it would require the availability of large number of devices to play with So the question, I mean, at this point, I am still harping on this point that why privacy amplification is somewhat necessary. So why not using DP federated averaging without privacy amplification? If I don't do privacy amplification, then what happens? You will see a same plot what we saw for CIFAR 10. This is on Stack Overflow. Why am I talking about Stack Overflow? This is the kind of a task that will be actually the, the real production one. So I'll be talking about Stack Overflow quite more in the rest of the talk. So we see still the gap. And again, the question is like, can we avoid sampling and achieve similar price privacy utility trade-offs? So this was the background on DPHD and DP federated averaging. Now let's go to the real algorithm which we want to implement. So this algorithm is called differentially private follow the regularized leader. DPFTRL. So, so to do that, let me go back to dphd or hgd rather and open up the recursion of hgd and let's say we are not doing any projection so this is like the vanilla hgd if you open up the recursion of hgd you will see that your update at time t plus one really depends on the sum of the gradients what you have seen so far right and i mean this is not a like <laughs> any deep insight but some of this particular 
observation actually will help us design the algorithm that we want. So, so remember that uh, the, from the slide, the update at time t plus one is essentially a scaled version of the gradients what you have seen so far. So now let's try to build the algorithm slowly. So you have these gradients, g0 to gn, and these gradients are data dependent. This is important because your next gradient, what you're going to query depends on the model what is in the previous case, okay? And what DPHD roughly does is it adds independent noise to each update. That's essentially what is happening, right? Okay, so how does it work? In DPHD, there's a pretty much a cartoon. You have G0, you add some noise, you get, and you add it up to G1 plus some noise, you add it up to G2 plus some noise and G3 plus some noise. So essentially you are getting, this is how the state update process works in DPHD if you look at Victoria. Okay. Excepting, now if I look at the total noise added to the sum of the gradients, like let's say I'm looking at the total noise added at the last gradient, in the last model, then DPHD would add noise in the order of square root of N over epsilon if you don't have amplification, where N is the number of gradient updates I'm doing. If I use amplification, I will get a, get to the error in the order of one over epsilon. So I get a boost of square root of n. And in the previous pictures, I was like hand wavily saying that like deep, uh, amplification helps you get a better privacy to trade off. This is a quantification version of it. Like you get a square root of n improvement if they make n state updates. Right. Now the the trick we would use is what is called tree aggregation for prefix sum. This idea has been there from 2010 by a couple of papers by Dwork, Naur, Pitassi, Rod Plum from 2010, and Ken, Song, and Shi from 2010. So these two papers simultaneously came up with the idea. And the idea is fairly elegant. What you do is <clears throat> instead of blindly adding noise, to each of the, the each of the new state of uh, new gradients, what you do is ultimately you have to create the prefix sum, right? That's what you want to do. You want to find out the, at every time step, you want to find out all the sum of the gradients you have seen so far. So this is what I'm calling as prefix sum. Someone calls it cumulative sum also. So the idea is a very, <coughs> idea is very fairly simple. Essentially, you take G0 and G1 and you start building a tree on top of it. So what do you do? So when you get G0, you add noise to G0. So in the root, in the leaf level of the tree, you will add independent noise. Then when you get G1, you will also compute G0 plus G1 and add some noise to it. When you get uh, G3 and G4, you will add some noise to G3. In the, in the second level for adding up the red and the green one, you will add some noise. And at the top level, you will sum up all of these four gradients and you'll add some noise. Why did I do this? Notice that if I change any one of the leaf nodes, any one of the gradients, only the path from the leaf to the root only gets changed. Whereas when I was doing uh, the DPAGD style analysis, you notice that if I change the first gradient, all the cumulative sum changes together. Here, only the path from the leaf to the root changes. And in differential privacy, essentially, all we need to do is to bound the, uh, the, the what you call the sensitivity, which essentially boils down to how much by changing one user's data or one gradient affects the computation. And in this case, it only affects the log depth of the, uh, the height of the tree. Right? So now what I can do is I can add noise according to this tree. And my noise would scale as log n over epsilon. Because now any leaf node, which is the individual gradient, only affects the path from the leaf to the root. Okay. It is close to DPHD, but not, uh, but the notice that uh, we are off by a factor of log n with respect to this DPHD bound. But remember, DPHD required amplification, whereas this algorithm will not require any form of amplification. It would act work on streaming data, essentially. So you don't need any kind of randomness to amplify. You can take variance of this tree for weighted averages to get some better uh, better estimates of the 
prefix sum, but that I'm leaving it for the purpose of the talk. If you are noticing this picture for the first time, it is also worth noting that uh, you can write in the form of uh, what are called hard wavelets. I mean, there's a fancy name given to this tree, but essentially uh, I'm taking basically a wavelet transform. DPFTRL is what is the crux of the talk, but FTRL is not. FTRL has been done from 2010. It is a fairly well-studied algorithm in the uh, in the learning community from 2010. I mean, there are at least three papers which can be attributed to this idea. McMahon in 2010, Ducci, Singer, I'm forgetting the H part, and uh, Lin Jiao from 2010. So the idea is, I mean, again, looking at HGD update, you have theta t plus one and theta t minus one over lambda gt. And FTRL essentially does the following. Which is, it minimizes the inner product of the cumulative sum with the model and with the L2 regularizer. I will wait for 30 seconds but it's worth noting that these two updates are exactly the same. If you write the minimizer and just take the gradient, the updates would be identical. So the idea of representing gradients in the form of cumulative, I mean, uh, the state updates in the form of cumulative sum or prefix sums is not new to our work. It has been there from 2010. These are also called dual averaging methods. So the observation is that it is equivalent to HGD under appropriate choice of the initial model. So, I mean, the way I wrote it, theta zero has to be zero, basically to make sure that they're equivalent. Right. So the crucial aspect is to get a private version of all the prefix sums during the training process. And what it says me is that it does, it does not require amplification. Okay, so now the idea is pretty simple. Uh, what I will do is, instead of uh, feeding in the true prefix sum of the gradient, I will feed it through this binary tree what we just built. So again, in the binary tree, what do you do? You have the, as the gradients come in, you continue building the tree and each node in the tree stores the sum of all the gradients in its uh, leaf nodes of the subtree and you will add noise independently to each of them, each of the nodes in the tree. And the point is that any single node in the leaf can affect only the path from the leaf to the root. Okay. Again, going back to the flow diagram. Here, the important part is that there's no sampling requirement. So you will just take the next batch of devices, whatever comes to you. Compute the, uh, for example, gradient, clip the gradient, take the average, do the DP tree aggregation, and you feed in this prefix sum to the model, except in the model update is not now on theta t to theta t plus one, you will basically feed in the cumulative gradients and you will open up the deep, uh, the AGD recursion and you will write the update that way. In implementation, we don't do that. In implementation, you essentially will take the difference of the noises to make sure that the things are equivalent. Basically, what I'm saying is that you can feed in this update equation into an HGD optimizer in a particular way and they would be equivalent. So you don't need to write a new optimizer per se. All you need to do is to take care of the noise. Okay. And yeah, so this version of the algorithm is from our recent paper in 2021, which essentially the deployment got built on. Here is some... Uh, equations to convince yourself that this is not just a practical algorithm, it has some theoretical nice theoretical properties. I will not go into the details of what is meant by online learning, but it is a, yeah, it, it is a framework where you basically study as data points arrive, you give, uh, you basically make some prediction and you pay 
the price in the hindsight as if, if the data were known to you in advance. So this is the classic idea of online learning. And what this particular algorithm shows is that this algorithm has the best regret guarantees what you know of today for any DP online learning algorithm. In particular for linear losses or least square losses like online linear regression, you will have both the adversarial regret or the stochastic regret. I haven't defined these terms. Adversarial regret is essentially where the adversary chooses the data point after, sees the, after it sees the output. Stochastic regret is the setting where the data points are drawn ID from some distribution. And we get for linear and least square losses, both expected and high probability regret to be the optimal one, which is of the form one over square root of n, n is the number of data points you are seeing, uh, plus square root of p, p is the dimensionality of the model, over epsilon n. The important part is the DP term, the term that depends on the differential privacy on epsilon, that is a lower order term in n. So this is in that sense, the optimal one. For general convex losses, what we can show that it is, I mean, you get p to the power of one fourth over square root of epsilon n. As far as we know, this, I mean, this bound is not tight. For at least for population risk, we don't know for regret guarantees whether this is tight or not. And that's all. And these are the conclusions. So these are best ignored guarantees. Uh, it improves over a paper of mine in 2013 to get better regret guarantees. Uh, why am I talking about regret guarantees? Regret guarantee will immediately imply population risk or test error guarantee. And the last statement says that this is the best excess population risk guarantee for any single pass algorithm. We'll take a single pass algorithm which does not rely on convexity for privacy. So there are single pass algorithms which should give you better population risk guarantees than the algorithm what I'm talking about, but they may require convexity for privacy guarantees. So the privacy guarantee, the proof of privacy would require convexity in the model. And why that is not good for us? Because the first slide, in the second slide, I told you that I will be operating on non-convex model. So they become inapplicable in our city. It's a good open question to think that whether we can extend this style of algorithms to get uh, optimal excess population risk, and that would not depend on convexity for privacy. Okay, so that's the theory part of the algorithm. Now let me give you some ideas on how this algorithm fares in practice. Going to empirical evaluation. So we start with a uh, public data set, stack overflow, where we show that DPFTRL outperforms DPH uh, federated averaging without amplification. And this is in the, uh, you can think like the setup is essentially a simulation of federated learning. It is not important how the whole design is there. You can read in the paper, but the point is that if you just take DP federated averaging without amplification, it is no way close to DPFTRL in terms of accuracy. DPFTRL is competitive to DP federated averaging when epsilon is less than or equal to three. So you will see that like when for small epsilon and when it's a DP federated averaging, that's the point when I'm, and since it's a simulation experiment, I can pretend that there is amplification there because I control everything in the simulation, right? So if I do that, I will see that at epsilon less than or equal to three, DP uh, federated averaging might, may perform better but it is still competitive, FTRL is comp competitive, but as I go increase epsilon, FTRL scores over federated averaging. More generally, DP federated averaging lower amplification will increase epsilon. So, I mean, I haven't told how amplification works, but essentially if you have smaller epsilon in the final guarantee, this is actually better for amplification. So DP federated averaging does better. Then, DPFTRL, as I told you, does not require uh, amplification. It use it just the application of what is called the Gaussian mechanism, one of the earliest noise addition mechanisms for differential privacy. And as a result, we can get what is called a zero concentrated differential privacy guarantee. It is a slightly stronger version of the definition what I showed to you earlier in the first slide about differential privacy. And for what it is worth, ZCDP is the definition that has been used for uh, reporting by US census, as far as we know from public sources. 
So this is on uh, academic data set. Now let's go to the actual production model. For obvious reasons, I cannot give you the exact parameters or the accuracy numbers, but I'll give you as far as we know how to say publicly. So we trained a 1.3 million parameter recurrent neural network language model. This was used for next word prediction for Spanish keyboard users. So basically on, when you open keyboard, the next word you are typing, it makes a prediction using some RNN model. The training, the actual final training actually ran for 2000 rounds over six days and six and a half thousand devices participating per round. So when I told you that there are ways of incorporating privacy amplification in the system design, this number from six days would shoot up like significantly higher. So that makes it harder for them to kind of train. Okay. We were looking at user level privacy guarantee. So it was necessary that any user does not contribute arbitrary number of times. We configured each device to participate in training at most once every 24 hours. The privacy accounting, I mean, to be honest, was a mess because users are participating every 24 hours. You don't know when exactly the users are participating. So you have to kind of account for all of that and we have to design ways to account for the privacy, which can be provably stated. So we have a multi-pass uh, accounting, privacy accounting based on what is called minimum separation. And this is in the, our archive paper. We can get, uh, I mean, the, the accounting essentially depends on a not so nice looking dynamic program. And the part that is important here is that all our implementation of the privacy component is public. It is uh, the, the collab what we use for privacy, uh, the privacy accounting is public and also it is implemented in terms of privacy, which is one of the DP libraries from Google. Okay. So this is how we train the model. And the two things are, and I will have in the next slide. One thing important is that although I did not give you the, although I did not give you the gap from the non-private model to the private model, this is obvious because here we had to train with privacy. We don't have the non-private model per se. And the, I also did not give you the accuracy numbers, but what is important is that this is a production model. And the fact that it's a production model, you cannot ship a model unless it reaches a particular accuracy bar, which has got nothing to do with privacy. So the team would not actually allow us to deploy it. So it had to actually have a pretty good accuracy. Okay. So here's the bold claim. To our knowledge, is the first production neural network trained directly on user data announced with a formal DP guarantee. And as in the beginning of the talk, I told you that the word formal is kind of uh, heavy here. And the reason is that we had to say something which is defendable. And in this case, we had to do like all of this, like design a new algorithm, design, uh, change some of the protocols of the federated learning where you do users contribution bounding, like a user that does not contribute multiple times, the user contributes once in every 24 hours and all those things. The full details of how we do it and what are the things is in a Google AI blog post from February. This training satisfies user level 0.1 ZCDP for well-behaved clients. Why it is well-behaved? Something which, uh, a device which faithfully follows the algorithm, including participation limits. And this is all we can anyway say, right? Because I, as a device, I can do arbitrary things. With the control on the device. But for well-behaved clients, which faithfully follows the algorithm, this is the property. The point is, another point to mention is that the misbehaved clients do not adversely affect the privacy guarantee given to the well-behaved clients. So the well-behaved clients will still have the same privacy guarantee. The misbehaved clients may not have that. And the point is that we tried our best to minimize the number of misbehaved clients, which is not like, which is not something significant, that number. And the model quality improved over the previous DP federated average trained model, which is a published work. So we can look at that. Although incomparable, just to set that in contest, U.S. census used a, uh, U.S. census was solving a different problem. 
So these are absolutely not compatible numbers, but to set the thing in context, US Census was using a ZCDP of 2.56 and we get a ZCDP of 0.81. Because if I don't give the scale, it is unclear how do I even interpret the number. So we get a ZCDP of less than one and US Census uses 2.56. Okay, so this is all I had to say of this production model. In the last part, I would say something more speculative, less, uh, less, uh, I guess, less thought out. I would say. But we have been working on improving the uh, improving the algorithm in the last few months, and we have some new results. So this is DP FTRL plus plus. So again, FTRL update. You are computing a sequence of prefix sums, and you are computing using this tree, right? So let me take you to a different view of the same algorithm is you have a matrix and the cumulative sum essentially is a matrix vector multiplication where the gradients are showing up and you are multiplying with the uh, lower triangular matrix with all ones. It might not be obvious immediately, but this is a form of convolution, basically a computing convolution, a part of the computation. Okay. So now let's call this matrix to be the query matrix A and these gradients are appearing and you are you are trying to do a matrix vector multiplication. For simplicity, just pretend in one dimension. Trust me, it will extend to higher dimensions fairly easily if you write the linear algebra properly. So you have to contribute A times G. Now the idea is that I will factorize A into B, C. So in the context of tree aggregation, this is A, the lower triangular matrix, that's the prefix I'm going to compute. C is the encoding of the matrix as encoding of the tree. Look at it for 10 seconds, it should be obvious why it is an encoding of the tree. So the leaf nodes are the top four rows, and then the second level is the fifth row, and the sixth row, and the final level is the seventh row. Right? And the reconstruction, how do you actually finally get the prefix sum? You can write the matrix B. The point is that tree aggregation is a special instantiation of matrix factorization. Why do I write it this way? Well, if I want to do DP estimate of A times G, I can write as uh, A times G is equal to B times C times G. G is the gradient vector plus some noise, which if I factorize out, essentially I get B times noise. Now the noise should be sufficient to ensure DP. That's what is necessary. But for the error, essentially what it happens, like if you write down the error of DPFTRL, it is essentially would be dependent on the uh, squared norm of the B times the noise. So essentially you want to minimize B times the noise squared or the expectation of that subject to the condition that the noise is sufficient for giving you DP. Okay. In our work, we design faster noise optimal methods to factorize the matrix A. So we'll feed in this constraint to minimize the squared norm. And then we will try to factorize the matrix A. Uh, one privacy challenge uh, for people who follow this area is that it is uh, so we needed to get a new privacy proof if the matrices C are non uh, non lower triangular, meaning that when you take C times G, G is the gradient vector, right? So the noise added at the next step can depend on the noise added in the previous step or the or the noise added at the later stages. So if C is not lower triangular, then we needed a new privacy proof to prove adaptive privacy because the gradients are adaptive in nature. So the next gradient we compute depends on the previous answer and this kind of creates weird correlations among the noises. So we needed a new privacy proof. This is a publicity of our recent paper, which is on archive, where we essentially do all these things. And what we show is that for stack overflow, so what is, so sorry, I have to say this over this slide. Yeah, so this is our paper and we again do the experiment on stack overflow. And here you will see bunch of algorithm names, optimal factorization, optimal prefix sum, Honecker full, Honecker online. None of them have, uh, I have told you what they are. Optimal factorization is the one where I actually factorize A into B times C, where I try to optimally minimize the L2 squared error between B and C, the noise. Optimal prefix sum is the algorithm where I fix the uh, the C matrix that is which is 
interacting with the data to be the prefix sum matrix, uh, 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 to be the tree aggregation matrix, I only optimize for B. Honecker full is a version of tree aggregation where I do some variance reduction and so is Honecker online. The full, the point is that uh, the blue line surpasses over all the three. And even if you on this test accuracy numbers, the gaps look reasonably small. It is a significant gap. Furthermore, to prove the privacy for the first three algorithms, we needed this adaptive privacy guarantee, what, what I mentioned in this previous slide. So I encourage you, if you are interested in this line of work, please go and check out our paper. Now I'm almost done with my talk. I'll tell some of the future directions. The question is, we looked at DPFTL as an algorithm, and this is a purely theory question, is can we get tight regret guarantees for DP online convex optimization, DP OCOs? So this algorithm gives the tight guarantees for linear and uh, least squared losses. This unclear you get it for general OCOs. Next is more of a philosophical question. In a lot of the implementations of DP learning, variance of privacy amplification is embedded into it. This is one case where I showed that it was, you can design algorithms which does not rely on amplification and which can operate on over streaming data. The philosophical question is, is privacy amplification necessary in any form when you are dealing with practice? The third question is, in what other real world applications we can provide meaningful user level DP guarantees which can be defended? So in many situations, it is said that, okay, our algorithm satisfies differential privacy. That's not a well quantified statement. It has to be quantified with the parameter. And second, and thirdly, that parameter has to be defendable. If you're, st if you're staying in the realm of differential privacy, of course, there are other ways of minimizing privacy risks, which are equally important. But if you're staying in the realm of differential privacy, then it is, and it is, it is probably uh, important to take the privacy parameter. And the final question is like, how can we, so, okay, when we do DP learning, it is known that the privacy actually, in this case, it was not that, but in many cases, privacy actually works as a significant impediment in terms of the accuracy. The question is, can we leverage other forms of data like public data or different data sources and combine them effectively to get accuracy boost in DP learning? And here is a acknowledgement to all the folks who were involved in the whole project. This was not just my project, but a lot of people were involved across multiple teams and it was a multi-year project. And that is all I have. So much, so let's get some questions. So whoever has a question, you can either come in the microphone or I can give you the microphone so they can find. I believe so. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Um, so it seems like you're trying to move away from using privacy application, mm -hmm. amplification. But I'm wondering, could you apply privacy amplification on top of this, all the regularized no. leader thing? No. Why is that? Because we, uh, the, the algorithm, why you, how you do it, first of all, you don't know how to use privacy amplification, first of all, in the setting we are operating on. Yeah. Because I told you that in this case, I don't have control over the data. I cannot. And yeah, we are looking for. Yeah, if you were for, in a case where you, yeah. even If you are in a case, you would, but also the, the, the style of the algorithm, if you look at it, it is unclear how to use privacy amplification in this particular in this particular algorithm. In SGD, you can use pretty easily, but here I'm just adding notch to the, the cumulative sums. So it's kind of unclear how to do, or what extra benefit you would get from privacy amplification. Okay, cool. Um, and then my other question is just, uh, for each client, are they providing multiple data points every time they're sending data to the- No, every time they send data, they, they do local updates and they send one gradients. 
Okay. But throughout the training process, the client would participate multiple times. Uh -huh. But we minimize the number of times the client participates and the number of times the client part. I mean, a client would participate once in every twenty-four hours. Right, and is that so that they're not like over, like yeah. so that if you take one client out, yeah. they're not like yeah. you're not taking too much data out. Exactly. Okay, cool. thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, it's very impressive to see uh, differentiated private federated and actually deployed in practice. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a couple of kind of non-technical questions. Um, first, um, a lot of times when we try to deploy, uh, you know, differentiated private or um, anything that involves privacy um, into practice, there tend to be uh, a trade-off. You know, between privacy versus mm -hmm. performance, efficiency, and so on. Um, I was wondering, um, in the uh, process of deploying them into practice, did you face challenges that are non-technical, like in, for example, convincing the leadership to deploy um, something that involves privacy, or are you like, um, did you have any challenges in that, or? It's just very supportive that uh, the, the big tech companies know that this is the right thing to do and we should do it. Uh, what's the main motivation for them to adopt uh, privacy techniques? Um, That's a fairly deep question. So let me try to <laughs> say it like on my small car, whatever, I, whatever my experience has been over the years. So privacy, yes, it creates trouble when you try to train models. But in this particular case, we did not for for the setup of the problem, maybe. And as as I tried to highlight in the talk, that the problem itself required an algorithm, new algorithm design, and required some time. So non technical, I mean, a non technical answer is that like it requires time to develop these things. So I mean, if you are working in a term, shorter time window, there can be pushbacks. But my personal experience has been uh, that. I have not seen pushback from the leadership on this kind of effort. It's actually very supportive. It's, so, but this is only for the organization where you work. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Um, the other question is, so differential privacy has been very successful in, in getting deployed in many companies, many, many scenarios. And also um, there's more and more awareness in the privacy issues, um, even to the general public. So I was wondering uh, if you think that there's any experience that we can learn. Um, in, in the future, maybe we try to deploy other uh, techniques from, from the crypto community. Uh, I guess the only thing is, I mean, to when we say general public, is it like, I mean, it's clearly not the people who come to this conference. <laughs> not, yeah, definitely yeah. not only yeah. the people here, but also, when you talk to people about privacy, they would know the notion, at least be aware of the notion of differential privacy and the companies are doing the right thing for them, protecting their privacy uh, and so on. So I think one thing to do is that, uh, I mean, be as open as you can about the work, try to make it heavily scrutinized by the external world. And if you're making a statement, make a claim like, okay, this is what I'm saying. And and make a refutable claim, which can be refuted, and give enough evidence to the other side to actually make it possible to refute it. Now the question is, uh, yeah, with that would probably build some confidence because if you talk to a general public, it is very hard to kind of kind of explain what differential privacy is. Like it's a fairly technical uh, notion, and that would be one way to kind of give faith to the community that this is meaningful. Thank you. Hi, um, I really like your talk. Um, I was wondering, so at the beginning of the talk, you situated us in a in a um, setting where uh, the trust boundary is drawn uh, around um, the data holders and the uh, person training the model, right? Um, how do you uh, imagine this work translating to a uh, tighter security model where there's less trust between the data holders and the model trainer. 
Yeah, so in these cases, you will try to use some kind of SQL multiplicity computation or some variants of that where essentially the devices are trusted, the protocol, I mean, you'll run some crypto protocol to run on it. These are, these are questions which people are looking at. I'm unfortunately not the right person to kind of tell something about it. This goes in more of crypto, but my uh, very vague understanding of these things are like the scale at which you're operating, the technology is not yet there to actually kind of operate at the scale. Like on SMC that like, I don't know how many billions of devices, but yeah, so theoretically it is feasible. The question, and it is a very important question to push that trust boundary out of this part. But in the talk, I explicitly said the trust boundary because I had, to, I said the word formal, I will give a formal guarantee. So it means like what trust boundary and operating on this is trust boundary. Thank you. Questions? So if some questions come at the, at the front, I have some questions. Yeah. Um, so I wanna ask first about the MPC question. Uh, is there any restriction on the running time? Because if you use MPC, it will also increase a lot the running time. So do you have any like restriction on how fast you want um, this computation to happen? reasonable like here it was like six days i mean six days to i mean this also depends on like we i mean in the in the organization setup we don't own the product it's on the product side who would actually own it and if i go and tell them it would require two months to train it's yeah. uh yeah so it, it, yeah there is some version of the restriction there and in in any of the deployments i guess like not just this one like any of the other deployments like if the running time goes prohibitively large no that makes sense yeah. and also want to ask about the misbehaved clients yeah so two questions there so in practice when you put it in production like how many clients misbehave meaning they can they can submit like uh, distributions of gradients that they're like too wrong or too far so how does this affect the accuracy or it didn't in practice it did not impact the accuracy uh, i mean the main reason it did not have impact the accuracy we use this clipping the gradients the clipping so even if i some submit something i'll clip it Okay, so right. Cool. Yeah, and talking about the misbehaved clients, first of all, the numbers are like minuscule, and uh, the seg at least whatever we felt is or the scale it was. And the second thing is that at one level, you you cannot control them to be honest, because if I like flush my OS and install a, like a malicious OS and do something, so. But the, another important point is that the behavior of the misbehaved clients does not impact the privacy of the well-behaved ones. So yeah, that's interesting. Just like curious, but you're saying that not so many were misbehaving. Yeah. And also if the client participates very often, I mean, you mentioned something about the 24 hour yeah. lag. Um, so if they keep using the same data, so do you need to have any notion of information privacy under continual observation? If they this, is, this is completely continual so, observation. So yeah. all of it. Okay. Yeah, there's a complete user level. Yes. Are there more questions? And the last question out of curiosity, why is Spanish language? Huh? What, why is Spanish language? Why, is, why is European Spanish? Yeah, what about the other language? Good question. Actually, I, I was not involved in the, that part, but I guess that was the group which was interested in doing this at this point, yeah. starting with this. Okay, thank you so much. It was a great talk.